Well, it's my great joy had to be with you today, and I pass on my regards and best wishes to every Christian leader who's part of this Christian Leaders Fellowship Online World Conference. Now, you know, the Lord Jesus every now and then would say something, and it would shape a lot of things. Like, like when someone said to him, um, what's the most important command? And he said, the most important command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. He said, the second is like it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. He said, all of the law and the prophets are summarized in this one statement. Well, people are really, really familiar with that one. And that was just uh, the Lord Jesus condensing uh, everything that had previously been sent into a single greatest and second greatest command. Well, a lot of people turn a blind eye to when Jesus gave his seminal thought with regards to all of his parables. Now, it comes in Mark's gospel and chapter 4. Now, we understand both through history and tradition that uh, the Apostle Peter was the uh, author and Mark was the scribe. And it's the first of the gospels that were written. And this is the very first parable of the first gospel that was written. And the Lord Jesus told a parable about a farmer who went out to sow seeds. And he gave that as a message. But then not only did he give the message, but he then explained the message. He exegeted it to his own disciples. And that's actually where we are going to enter today. It's the Lord Jesus opening up his own statement about the parable of the sower. And we read this in Mark 4. It says, Then Jesus said to them, If you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parables? Here comes a seminal thought. Here comes a key that helps us to unlock and understand more broadly what the Lord Jesus had to say. Now he interprets his own parable. He said, the farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. Now, I want to point out a really simple and obvious thing here. Jesus did not identify who the farmer is. He did identify what the seed is. The seed is the word of God. But he didn't identify who the farmer was. Now, you can go and you can check out a lot of your Bible commentaries. Some of them will say this is Jesus explaining his own ministry as if Jesus exclusively is the farmer. I think that's unwise. I think it's unwise because the Lord Jesus was more than prepared to say, I am the, you know, I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection of the life. I am the gate or the door, etc. He was more than prepared to say that. You know all of those statements, especially in John's gospel. But here he doesn't say, I am the farmer. He simply says, the farmer. Now, here's one of the ways that Christian leaders miss substantive truths in this parable. Firstly, to understand they have two parts to play. They can both be the farmer, that is those who bring the word of God to others. And they also are the soil, that is those who receive the word of God. So let's just acknowledge right up front, Jesus simply said, The farmer plants the seed by taking God's word to others. Anyone can do that. This is not something that it's exclusively for the trained ones. Now, I'm a a senior pastor. I've I've been a Baptist pastor, pastor for over three decades now. I've done my studies. I know what it's like to do your discipline studies and to do your, your, uh, your Greek studies and all those sorts of things. And ministers can be at risk and Christian leaders can be at risk of pulling this mission of taking the word of God to others towards themselves, like they exclusively have the right and the responsibility to be the farmer. That would be very unwise because that's also not what Jesus is saying here. He's simply saying the farmer are those who bring the word of God to others. Think about Peter and John when they stood before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, and they could see their boldness And it speaks about them observing that they were unschooled and ordinary men. That's the way it translates in English. The two Greek words there to describe them are that they were a grammatos idiotes. I don't even think you need to be a Greek scholar to understand the implications of what's being said there. These ordinary unschooled men, these are grammatos idiotes. They were the ones who were bringing the word of God uh, to others in that scenario. You see, the mission of God is in the hands of ordinary people. Anybody can bring the word of God to others. First big learn from this parable. The farmer plants seeds by taking God's word to others. Then he says, the seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have Satan come uh, uh, at once and take it away. In Luke's gospel, he links the capacity to understand what was said 
with regards to it being snatched away uh, with the devil. Simple point here for Christian leaders is to explain the word of God in a way that's easy to understand. To become deep is not to become complex. In fact, we can be really simple without being simplistic. I think it's part of the challenge of the communicator to take God's truths and communicate it in such a way that people can understand it. You can look it up in your Old Testament studies, but you'll find there is a word which can be translated both to teach and to learn. It's the same Hebrew word, lamad. Therefore, the principle is to teach is to cause to learn. So in other words, as I'm bringing the word of God to others, I do it in such a way that I cause them to learn. You know the saying, you can lead a horse uh, to water, but you can't force it to drink. But here's the point, you can salt its oats. In other words, you can make it thirsty. So as we bring the word of God to others, let's do it in a way it's not simplistic, because that would be to deny its capacity and its depth and its profound nature, but it can be simple. In other words, we bring it in a way that people can understand it. If we don't do that, we simply give the devil an opportunity to snatch it away because people don't understand it very well. Jesus goes on. He said, the seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. I'd describe this group of people, this soil, and it's worth just noting, the soil repeatedly describes people. The soil in this, in this parable is people. Here it's people who are vulnerable. Like they actually want to receive the word of God and they, they do receive it with joy, but they're vulnerable. And they're, not only are they vulnerable uh, to persecution, but Jesus said they haven't got their roots down deeply. Now, you could either understand that deep in understanding or you could understand that as deep in context. Now, what we actually know is that Christian people who are profoundly connected to other Christians where relationship is the glue, they are far less vulnerable. Even though life will throw a lot of turmoil at them, because they are well connected to other Christians, because Christians are not supposed to do their Christian life in isolation. We do it in relationship with others. That's the second type of soil. Jesus describes the third type of soil, third type of person. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out. Now, please notice here what Jesus is saying here about people is for some, the issue is spatial. You see that? The message is crowded out by the worries of this life, by the lure of wealth and the desire for other things. So there's not room in their heart for the word of God. They're so consumed by concerns. Like, how have you been going with COVID-19, the global pandemic? Like, how's your worry meter been? Even though the Bible repeatedly says, do not worry. Jesus said it himself, don't worry. Like our challenge of worry, that which could be, is actually a challenge of faith. Do I trust God? I don't know what the future is going to bring. Do I trust God? In, in Philippians 4, I spoke about turning your worries into praise. Don't be anxious for anything, he said. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Don't be anxious for anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So for this type of person, when the word of God comes to them, the challenge is spatial. Whether it's worry, whether it's the lure of wealth, whether it's desire for other things. But look at the impact the impact is significant we're going to be pausing substantively on this impact so no fruit is produced what does that mean what does it mean for no fruit to be produced we're going to get to that shortly then he describes the final type of person and he describes them as good soil so the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept god's word and produce a harvest of 30 60 and even 100 times as much as had been planted. So now in Luke's gospel, he describes it as a huge harvest. He talks about this type of person as a, as a, um, a good hearted, an honest person. And they accept the word of God. Now I could say to each one of you, which type of soil do you want to be? Everyone's going to say, I, I want to be good soil. Uh, I could then follow it up by saying, are you good soil? And that's a question you alone can answer because the good soil isn't described in a vacuum. Good soil is not just a personal opinion. 
good soil produces a harvest. Luke says a huge harvest. So now we've got Jesus using the language of one soil that produces no fruit. And then we've got the good soil that is producing a, a huge harvest. And, and it's, it's a multiplication effect. So here's the question. What's the harvest? There's Luke speaking about it there in Luke 8. The good soil, honest, good-hearted people. Hear the word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. So what is the huge harvest? harvest. Well, there's a couple of ways you can understand and interpret this. One way to interpret it is what I would describe as redemptive lift. People see the word fruit, they go straight to the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And, and, and that sense of, well, you know, if fruit's going to be produced, there's going to be fruit in my own life. In other words, when a person puts their trust in Jesus, there is redemptive lift. A bigger version of themselves is created. A version that's more like Jesus. That's what the Bible says, doesn't it? When it says this is God's <clears throat> foreordained plan, that we be conformed to the images of His Son. So the more our lives are transformed, the more our lives become like Jesus, there is a redemptive lift. A bigger version of us comes out. One that's more loving, one that's more patient, one that's more kind. Is that the huge harvest? Is that the fruitfulness? The risk of interpreting it exclusively like that, because I think that's part of the truth, but the risk of, it, of interpreting it exclusively like that is that the work of Jesus could finish with you. And I believe that's inconsistent because you're not designed to be a bucket, you're a conduit. You are loved by God so that He can love others through you. You are forgiven by God so that you can be more forgiving to others. We experience the grace of God so that we can demonstrate grace towards others, whatever God has done in you. And so God can do it through you. Now we're getting more consistent with the metaphor of the Word of God coming to us so that the Word of God can go through us to others. A seed is sown so that we ourselves then can become farmers who in an ongoing way sow seed. In this sense, the harvest would be a lot more like souls. Why would I go there? I'd go there because in John chapter 4, Jesus put it like this, verse 35. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both planter and the harvester alike. Here we have the Lord Jesus connecting the idea that a seed has already been sown, there's time for a harvest, and he speaks of fruit and harvest and souls. Jesus himself connected them together. So this, this great harvest in that sense, and the fruit that's being produced here in this sense, is now souls. Now, it was the Lord Jesus who said, if you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand the other parables. This is, not the, this is not the only place where Jesus normalizes the idea of multiplication, not only in us, but through us to others. I wonder if this puts a different light on what Jesus said in John chapter 15, when he said, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Now, you could interpret that fruit of the Holy Spirit. I'm producing much fruit. I'm being more loving. Or you could understand it as souls. I'm producing much fruit because the fields, they're white under harvest. He spoke about it again in verse 16. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. Now that turn of phrase, lasting fruit now, starts to make more sense if we're speaking about souls rather than simply a lasting character inside our own person. And to be fair, I think it's both and. In, in all the language that's being spoken of here and with regards to the parable of the sower and for our lives, not only to be the farmer, but for our lives to be the good soil, I'm going to go both and. I think it is to do with the fruit of the Holy Spirit being developed in our own hearts. But I think if we restrict our understanding to that, I think we are profoundly missing the point 
of this first parable, this key parable. If you don't understand this, you're not going to understand anything else because it is ultimately a parable about multiplication, the normalizing and the expectation of the Lord Jesus that those who are going to be his disciples will be disciples who know how to multiply. Let's go back now. Let's hear these verses again. John 15 verse 8, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Great glory is brought to God as those who put their trust in Jesus discover what it is to be a disciple who knows how to multiply. Or when he said there in 15 verse 16, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. In other ways, the way, in other words, the way we steward the Word of God and the way that we take the Word of God to others is done in such a way that it empowers them to multiply. This is a profound lesson. It's an absolutely profound lesson because I want you to realize there's a profound difference between addition and multiplication. Jesus appears to be establishing a multiplication paradigm here. What's addition look like? Well, addition looks like the anointed leader, maybe an, anointed, maybe an anointed evangelist. They manage to bring the word of God and they save one. And then they bring the word of God and they save another. They bring the word of God, they save another. They could even speak to a crowd. They bring the word of God in such a word, in such a way to a crowd that multiple people are saved. And in that sense, you could say, well, look, aren't they being a multiplying disciple? But if they are not imparting the gospel in such a way that it empowers others to also become disciples that multiply, it is simply an addition model. I win one. I win another one. I win another one. It is an addition model. But if I disciple a person towards faith in Jesus in such a way that empowers them, and I also disciple them to a, a life of faith in Jesus, I now empower them that they themselves are able to do the same. I can remember when I realized that the Lord Jesus could have been born of a virgin, the sinless Son of God, truth teaching, miracle working, casting out demons, raising the dead, who ultimately gave his life on the cross to pay for our sins, was raised again from the dead and poured out the Holy Spirit. Like I, He could have done all of that without ever saying, follow me. Think about that. He could have done it all. He could have done the redemptive act. He could have taught us a lot of truth without ever saying, follow me. But he did. He did say, follow me. Out of a crowd of people, Jesus spent a whole night in prayer before. He called out 12 men from the crowd and he, he wanted them to become his disciples. He invited them into his world and then he began to disciple them towards faith in Jesus. Now, I know this is a global audience. I know this is absolutely true in the Western context, but I've got a sneaking suspicion it's true in other contexts as well. One of the errors that Christian leaders make is that we think you have evangelism and then you have discipleship. We evangelize them by sharing the gospel. We bring them to a point where they put their trust in Jesus and then we have discipleship. But I want to say to you this, discipleship begins at first contact. Why do I say that? Because that's what the Lord Jesus did. He discipled them. He, did, he discipled them towards faith in him. And he did it in such a way. He did it in such a way that it was a rapid mobilization model. He got them going straight away. If there was in situ training, they were learning on the job. Growth was a byproduct. Now in the Western model of discipleship, we want to get them converted first. Then we want to train them. <clears throat> Sorry, we want to get them converted. Then we want to teach them. We want them to grow. Then we'll train them. Then we'll mobilize them. Jesus did it in the reverse order. He rapidly mobilized. He in situation trained. Growth was a byproduct and conversion happened somewhere along the way. That is a rapid mobilization, a multiplication model. I want you to understand this. Simple ideas multiply. Now, I touched on the difference between simple and simplistic early, but let me say it really clearly right now. There is a profound difference between simple and simplistic. Simplistic has a blind spot for a lot of complexity. Simple has worked our way through the complexity back to a zone 
where we're able to communicate it in a way that's easy to understand and easy to on-tell and implement. A friend of mine, Dr. Steve Addison, once said to me, Dale, why soccer the world game? I said, I've got no idea. Why soccer the world game? And he said, because anyone, anywhere, anytime can play a form of soccer. He said, a child with a tin can in an alley can play a form of soccer. He said, that's soccer all the way through to the World Cup final. He said, it's all soccer. Now, I thought he was giving me a soccer lesson. I was shrugging my shoulders saying, well, that's great. But when he said this to me, the earth moved under my feet. He said, Dale, until making disciples becomes that simple, it will not go viral. It was his doctoral work, movements that change the world, condensed into a sentence. And when we realize afresh that it was the Lord Jesus who said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me, go therefore and make disciples of the nations, baptizing them, teaching them to obey all I've commanded you. And lo, he said, I'll be with you even to the end of the age. And when we realize there's four all-inclusives in the Great Commission, all authority, go to all people, teach them all I've commanded, I'll be with you for all time. There are three participles which are doing type words those three participles in the greek are going baptizing teaching and there's one command in the great commission it's in the imperative in the greek make disciples therefore more literally jesus was saying as you are going i command you to make disciples if you only hear it as go and make disciples it sounds like the command is go but it's not Go as a participle. Literally, as you are going, I command you to make disciples. That's where the emphasis is. Now, here's the point. Making a disciple is therefore an as you are going activity. We, we open up a whole zone of challenge. That's what the Lord Jesus did. He opened up a zone. He did use events unmistakably. Jesus had points of contact and he used them very powerfully. But for the discipleship of his disciples, it was a zone of challenge. At the lead edge, Jesus is highly invitational. Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm gentle of humble and humble of heart, and you shall find rest for yourselves. Highly invitational. Whoever's thirsty, come unto me and drink. Highly invitational. At that invitational edge, now, the Lord Jesus was described by his detractors as a drunkard, a glutton, and a friend of sinners. The one who would attend Matthew's party with people of disrepute. High invitational, low barrier. But then hyperbolically, the closer you got to Jesus, he ramped up the challenge. Unless you take up your cross every day and carry it, you can't be my disciple. Unless you hate father, mother, brother, sister, yeah, even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. Unless you give away all you possess, you can't be my disciple. Phenomenal challenge. <clears throat> when the Lord Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot be my disciple. Phenomenal challenge. Crowds peeled away from him at that point in time. But en route, Jesus correctly and repeatedly calibrated invitation and challenge and he journeyed them he discipled them towards faith in him somewhere on route they put their trust in him but he was already rapidly mobilizing them he already had them in situation there was already reflection and action that was taking place and somewhere on route they put their trust in him and he discipled them all the way through to the point where he said he said my children he said my father is prepared to give the kingdom to you so this, this concept that simple ideas multiply is such an important one to grasp because if we are going to be disciples that know how to multiply, if we are going to be good soil so, when, so that the Word of God comes to us and then it multiplies in us 30, 60, 100 fold, sure, redemptive lift, a bigger version of us. I become more like Jesus. I'm more, I'm more loving. I'm, I'm, more, I'm, I'm more gracious and patient and kind. And all those sorts of things, the fruit of the Spirit. Sure, redemptive lift is real. But it's much, much more than that. I, not only do I personally need to be a disciple who knows how to multiply, but I need to disciple others in a way 
that they themselves can discover what it looks like to be a disciple who can multiply. Because remember, we are the farmer as well. I need to set them up to be the farmer. I need to set them up to, so they can be the farmer who sows the word of God. And the best way that we have learned to do this in our context here in Australia, the best way we've learned to do that is to look at what the Lord Jesus did when he sent the disciples out to the village for the first time. He did it again when he sent out the 72 to the villages. And he said, when you get there, amongst the multiple things he instructed them, but this one is key. He said, when you get to that village, you are going to find a person of peace. In the Greek, you're going to discover a Uios Arenes, which is a son of peace. I can imagine Peter and John walking out to a village for the very first time and saying, what do you reckon he meant by that kind of son of peace idea? And they go, I've got no idea. Like, how are we going to find them? I've got no idea. Like, Jesus even gave a failure clause. If you don't find that person, dust your feet off and, and, and move on. Look for that person. What's going to be typical of that person? When they spoke the blessing, when they spoke the good news about the kingdom, this person would lean in. They would listen. They'd pay attention. They would receive. They would receive what was said. The blessing would rest upon them. Jesus said, "He said, don't go from house to house. Allow that person to serve you, to extend hospitality to you." And so, this simple layering of they like you, as in they like the message, they listen to it, and they even want to serve it. He said, "Pay attention to that person." And so, with rather simple tools. We now empower our people with this phrase. I'm looking for someone to read the Bible with. I don't know whether you'd be interested. We encourage them to identify prayerfully a person of peace. Say, Father, in my world, where are you already active? It was the Lord Jesus who put it that way. The Lord Jesus said, I only do what I see my Father doing. And so, so we need to become pers pursuers of what God is doing. We need to have eyes to see and ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. We need to be able to prayerfully consider, God, where are you already at work? What is it that you're doing? I want to join you there. I would describe that as prevenient grace. God is there already. God has already prepared that heart. He invites us to join him there. Prayerfully consider who in your world fits the profile of a person of peace. They like you, they listen to you, they serve you. You become the farmer. You bring the word of God to them. I don't know whether you'd be interested. I'm looking for someone to read the Bible with. Like it's an open, it's an open, it's an easy question to ask. And we've seen a whole lot of people discover that on a, on a regular basis, just kind of week by week or even day by day, they sit, they open the Word of God, and they read it together in such a way that's so empowering for the pre-Christian person. Okay, I just want to give you a quick hint on this one. Never do anything that the pre-Christian person can't do. When you're looking at the Word of God together, we read a passage out loud a couple of times. We close our Bible. We try to retell it because it uses a different part of your brain. And then we sit quietly for five minutes. So just see what stands out. You look at it. Say anything about God or about us or life, anything. What stands out for you? And then you sit and look at the Word of God as well to see what stands out for you. You can pray for them at that point in time. But only do what they can do. Why? Because you ultimately want to empower them to be able to do exactly what you were doing with them with somebody else. So don't do what they can't do. Only observe what you can observe. Don't go exegeting it. Don't go, don't go tell them the Greek. Don't go, don't go tell them about the best sermon you ever heard on about or giving the biblical history around it. Just stick with what you can see. Let them share what they can see. You share what you can see. And then what you come out of the back with is, okay, so what are we going to do about this? Like, who are you going to tell? Rapid mobilization. And what is happening is week by week, you're discipling them around the Word of God with an obedience orientation. You're training them to have a listening ear to what God's saying to them from His Word. You are discipling them towards faith in Jesus. And at that point, not only are you the farmer who's sowing the Word of God into their lives, but at that point, you are demonstrating that you are a good soil because you're starting to be a disciple who knows how to multiply. And you're setting them up to be a disciple that knows how to multiply because the mission of God is in the hands of ordinary people. Making disciples needs to be a something that anyone, anywhere, anytime can do. As you are going, Jesus said, I command you to make disciples. So, are you good soil? 
Like, I know you want to say yes, but are you? Are you bringing the word of God to others in such a way that it sets them up to be disciples who know how to multiply? Or is your model an addition model? Win one, win one, win one, maybe even win a group. But never actually empowering them never actually discipling them towards faith, never doing it in such a way that you've dealt with the complexity so that they themselves can be rapidly mobilized. In situ, they can be trained. Growth will be a byproduct of their engagement. And what's more, somewhere en route, they will become a disciple of Jesus. With what I'm describing to you here, we've actually seen pre-Christian people mobilized with the word of God where they start reading it with their friend And their friend puts trust in Jesus before they do. With a model like this, the evangelist doesn't even necessarily have to be a follower of Jesus yet. They they become the farmer sowing the seed. They haven't even put their trust in Jesus yet, but they are literally, physically bringing the word of God to others because ultimately that work of salvation is something that God alone can do. Are you good soil? Have you got a multiplication mindset rather than an addition mindset? Do you receive from the Lord Jesus where he said, if you don't understand this one, you're not going to understand any of the parables. He launched with a multiplication, rapid mobilization model. He demonstrated it to us. It was how he did it. He spoke about it in this parable. May it be so in our lives as well. Would you please pray with me? So our Father in heaven, we come to you right now and we present our own hearts to you. Our Father in heaven, that we might be not only the farmer that brings the word of God to others, but that our hearts would be good soil, that multiplication, 30, 60, 100 fold can take place in us and that we can be disciples who know what it is to set people up, that they can multiply themselves as well with the word of God. God, I pray. I pray for a renewal of the Christian faith in the Western context where in Australia, we're in our seventh decade of decline. Father, I want to pray for those nations where the gospel is expanding rapidly, but I pray that it wouldn't just be in the evangelistic sense, but that we would be disciple makers, multiplying disciple makers. Do your good work in our hearts, I pray, by your Holy Spirit. Thank you so much. Thank you for what you've revealed to us today, that the word of God can be sown in our hearts and therefore may we be good soil. To the glory and the honor of the name of Jesus, amen and God bless you.